Hello, everybody. Can I start now? Hello, everybody. I'm Judy Lang, the very junior co-host of the virtual Coral Reef, Global Coral Reef Week meetings this week. And I'm moderating today's meeting. And our technical person is Francisca Elmer, an independent researcher and one of the two main co-organizers of Global Coral Reef Week. You may use the chat to introduce yourselves and we certainly encourage that. But please make sure you send your messages to all attendees so everyone can see who you are and um, get to know you. There will be two plenary talks today, followed by a question session. Questions for the chat should be submitted in the Q&A message box and not in the chat. And you can look at the questions that have been submitted and you can upvote questions to which you are most interested in hearing the answer. Our presenters today, as you can see, are Dr. Krista Sherman, who will be addressing NASA grouper research in the Bahamas, and Dr. Deba Mon, who will be talking about the hidden habitats of the Caribbean depths. If while you're listening to the talks, you encounter any technical difficulties and you're the only one who has them, please leave the session, leave the meeting and sign back in. And with any luck, your technical issue, issues will have been resolved. That's happened to me many times in the past. We will be starting with a quick poll on where you are now located. It's not where you're from, but it's where you're currently located. And so when uh, that comes up on the screen, we'll ask you to fill out one only of the choices here. And we'll give you a few seconds to make your choice. And then we'll close the poll. And pretty soon we'll see where you are located. So far this week, we've had lots of people from North America and Europe and the Caribbean. And we have, oh, lots of folks from the South America to 21% today, following only North America at 39%. A few, uh, nearly as many from Europe, 18%, 11% from the Caribbean, and other folks from Mesoamerica and the Pacific Islands, especially Hawaii, uh, five from the Asian region, and 3% from other. But nobody is up this late in Australia, or up this early, I guess, in Australia, or whatever time it is in Australia. And now we're going to have a quick poll on where most of, of, of uh, people are working or what most, what most closely matches where you work. And that will come up now. And what sector are you working in? Academia, are you a student? Conservation management, government, tourism, education, industry, or something else? And I'm not allowed to vote, and neither are our panelists, but they will tell you where they're from. Or I will tell you where they're from. And they will tell you what they're working on. So which sector are you working in? And we have more students than anyone else, 40%. Uh, followed by 24% are in academia, 14% in conservation or management. We have a nice representation of government at 7% and other forms of occupation, including education and tourism. Um, so the polls will now close and we will, um, I will introduce our first panelist, uh, Dr. Krista Sherman, who you can see smiling so beautifully in the photo here. She's a Bahamian with extensive experience in coral reef ecology. She's currently the senior scientist 
of the Perry Institute for Marine Research, for Marine Science, and she's responsible for its fisheries research and conservation programs. Even before the COVID-19 shutdown, their normal operations were scrambled when Hurricane Dorian flattened the Northern Bahamas last September and where the dreaded stony coral tissue loss disease has arrived as well. Nevertheless, Crystal will give us an overview on her NASA groupers research in the Bahamas. So welcome, Krista. And that is not Krista, that's Fran Elmer in Switzerland. But Krista Sherman should be sharing screen and here it's coming. Thank you, Judy. Thanks for that introduction and for the invitation to speak today on some of our NASA group of research and the con conservation efforts that we are working on here in the Bahamas. Uh, so this work that I'm going to be talking about today has been part of a collaborative project between the University of Exeter, the Shad Aquarium, the Bahamas National Trust, and the Perry Institute for Marine Science, where I'm currently based. So predator-prey interactions are really important for shaping and maintaining trophic structure in marine ecosystems. And NASA grouper are among the top teleos predators of coral reef habitats and are also an important food source for larger apex predators. Moreover, their formation of annual fish spawning aggregations or FSAs is not only responsible for replenishing NASA grouper stocks, but also for the addition of key nutrients that are important for coral reef health. In addition to their ecological importance, NASA grouper are highly valued economically and culturally, but they are at risk of extinction. Globally, NASA grouper are listed as critically endangered with one of the last viable populations found here in the Bahamas. And even here we have documented declines, mostly due to FSA fishing, which has drastically decreased NASA grouper populations and even collapsed some formerly active spawning sites so over the last decade of doing this work, we still see up to 40% of NASA grouper being caught illegally during the closed season. So from a research perspective, we embarked on a collaborative project to address some of the key knowledge gaps related to the status and population dynamics of NASA grouper with the goal of using this information to help inform recommendations for sustainable management. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm mostly gonna focus on the genetic research which was used to determine how genetically diverse and connected NASA grouper populations within the Bahamian archipelago are, and also to explore whether anthropogenic or human activities have compromised the genetic health of these fish. So for this part of the work, uh, collected fin clip samples uh, of NASA grouper from 13 islands covering the northern and southern extremes of the Bahamas. So the map you're seeing here is showing uh, the Bahamas and the sample locations are in blue. The Hail Mary FSA uh, is right here. Um, and we also collected samples from that FSA over three consecutive spawning seasons from 2014 to 2017. So the first component of this genetic work was based on microsatellite genotyping. Um, and microsites are actually commonly used molecular marker for population genetic studies. Specifically use this technique to understand the genetic architecture and current demographics of NASA grouper and to detect whether any changes have occurred to their population structure. So what you're seeing here is a plot showing that population structure is organized geographically from north to south. Uh, again, this is a Hail Mary FSA here. This was based on 14 uh, neutral microsatellite markers. Um, and each of these bars corresponds to an individual fish. And the, the genotypes are represented by the different colors you see. So in aqua and dark blue. So you notice that some fish have more of one genotype. But the important thing here is that for the Bahamas, we have two genetic stocks. Uh, there is genetic mixing that's occurring throughout the archipelago. And there is no geographic population structure based on this uh, microsatellite data. So we also ran some analysis to examine how the numbers of NASA grouper contributing to population size have changed over time compared to historic levels. And we looked at this from the present in zero to a thousand generations ago. And what we found is a systematic crash in population sizes all throughout the Bahamian archipelago. 
So you'll notice on the bottom of this graph, each of the islands are denoted with different colors. The Hail Mary FSA is here in green. The overall Bahamas is in black. Um, and what you're seeing is that that decline began around 400 generations ago, and there were accelerated declines within the last 150 to 200 generations. So really drastic declines from these historic stable levels of population size. And the timing of this decline corresponds to 3,600 years ago, which actually predates anthropogenic fishing activity. So that suggests that there is something happening naturally that's responsible for the observed drastic declines in population size that we saw. So we also looked at contemporary estimates and those also corroborate significant reductions in population size throughout the Bahamas. And we actually have evidence for more recent uh, bottlenecking events in three islands that are highlighted in red, as well as the Hail Mary FSA uh, that's also highlighted on, on the screen there. So the Microsat uh, genetic data show that NASA grouper within the Bahamas have and are experiencing reductions in the number of breeding individuals that are contributing to successive generations. And we also have evidence for historic and uh, more recent bottlenecking events. So microsats are a traditional marker and genomic markers such as restriction site associated DNA sequencing or RADSeq and whole genome sequencing cover much more of the genome than microsats. So you can improve the resolution that you're gaining using these techniques. So if you look at the Mona Lisa using RADSeq, you can see how much clearer that image is. Um, and with whole genome sequencing, uh, the full picture that you see. So we expected this technique to enhance the resolution and improve our capacity to unravel genetic diversity and divergence in NASA grouper, despite showing weak population structure as evidenced through the microsatellite uh, work that we did. So for this, I uh, used RADSeq to establish countrywide demographic structure and for genome-wide assessments of diversity and differentiation. So using the same uh, samples that were collected for the microsats, um, but fewer here, uh, just 96 grouper. So extracting high molecular weight DNA from those fish and using those for RAD sequencing. Um, and just to show you again, this is where the active uh, spawning site is here. So what you're seeing here is a discriminant analysis of principal components or a DAPC of NASA grouper. And instead of 14 uh, microsat markers, we now have 10,031 SNPs that we used. And what this enables was us to detect uh, distinct separations between Exuma here and Aqua, Long Island in gray from the rest of the Bahamas, as well as the Hail Mary FSA. So I've highlighted that area here in the inset map. So what that's showing is we have these distinct separations, but it's not related to geography. So because geography is not driving the patterns of differentiation that we saw, we explored whether selection may be influencing the patterns observed. So we used two environmental association tests, latent factor mixed models and redundancy analysis or RDA to screen for potentially adaptive loci. So these RDA of outlier SNPs was then used to visualize whether patterns of genetic structure could be attributed to loci or SNPs under selective processes. So we had a total of 16 SNPs that were associated with the environmental variables you see on your screen. So current sea surface temperature, primary productivity and salinity. And primary productivity uh, is driving differences in Ragged Island. And it looks like maximum sea surface temperature and current are influencing the northern and southern extremes of the Bahamas. So that's Abaco and Great Inagua. So Abaco in the north here, the inset map, and Great Inagua in the southern Bahamas. Uh, we also uh, looked at these outlier SNPs based on the environmental association tests and aligned them to the genome of red spotted grouper to investigate the functional attributes or gene ontology. So a total of 67 non-overlapping hits were uh, associated with 58 genes when we did that alignment. And those outlier SNPs that are possibly under selection were also connected to a range of really important biological and molecular functions, for example, osmoregulation, metabolic processes, 
uh, and muscle differentiation. So the observed genomic differences between Exuma and Long Island from the rest of the Bahamas, it was something interesting and surprising, but it suggests that there may be subtle differences in gene flow uh, that are occurring among NASA grouper from these islands. So because we don't have uh, natural or physical barriers to gene flow in the ocean, there are a few probable explanations for the patterns of genetic connectivity that we observed in these fish. And they include buried migration patterns and adult dispersal capabilities. So from the acoustic telemetry work that we've done, uh, we know that these fish are capable of migrating really long distances, sometimes exceeding 200 kilometers. Uh, there's also evidence for site fidelity to specific FSAs, and the actual timing of these migrations is linked uh, to the full moon. Additionally, there may be intraspecific differences in larval survivorship dispersal and recruitment. And recruitment for NASA grouper is variable from one year uh, to the next. There also are lower densities of NASA grouper outside of the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park, which is a no-take marine protected area. And there may be div divergent uh, selective pressures between islands. So it looks like these long distance migrations are probably gonna be more energetically costly and thus may explain the presence of those outlier loci or SNPs that we found that were associated with osmoregulation, metabolic processes um, and muscle function, which also had uh, links to the environmental variables um, that we looked at. So from a conservation perspective, then, the preservation of genetic variation is a really important component to mitigate biodiversity loss. And this is something that definitely should be integrated into management planning. Uh, and with regards to that, we have developed a conservation management plan for NASA Grouper. And the overall goal of this plan is to promote population recovery and a sustainable NASA Grouper fishery. So we've outlined some specific objectives within that management plan, and they include increasing density and in spawning stock biomass. Uh, we have also recommended some changes to fishery regulations with biological justifications for those changes so that they're uh, promoting sustainable fisheries practices. Uh, there also needs to be a reduction in the anthropogenic threats that the species experiences. And we also need to work on maintaining and or improving essential marine habitats that are important to this species throughout its life cycle. To advance this work, we have conducted some preliminary uh, stakeholder assessments to understand what stakeholder perspectives on NASA grouper are, specifically as it relates to environmental change, uh, fisheries management, legislation and enforcement, as well as science, education, and outreach. And so there is some preliminary stakeholder support to and willingness to support changes to existing regulations, as you see B on the left, for example, increasing the minimum uh, size limit and extending the closed season to uh, protect the species during the entire reproductive window, um, as well as uh, support for in including some new uh, regulations, for example, quotas um, and restricting the use of certain fishing gear um, during the spawning season. We've also been further advocating for this work through the submission of a policy brief that was submitted to the Department of Marine Resources in 2018, and that was done with support of the Bahamas NASA Grouper uh, Working Group. So to summarize, uh, from the genomic work, we are seeing intraspecific population structure. So there is fine scale genetic variation, particularly separating Exuma and Long Island from the rest of the Bahamas. And using RADSEQ, we were able to obtain new information on potential loci that are associated with selection for NASA grouper. So in addition to these historical events and the recent anthropogenic activities, particularly uh, fishing pressure, uh, it appears that uh, selection may also be an important driver in shaping contemporary genetic population structure for this species. And this is something that certainly warrants further exploration to explore all the processes influencing selection. And this is relevant because these findings may have important implications for long-term survival of the species in light of future anthropogenic disturbances, for example, increases in uh, sea surface temperature related to global warming, um, which may, may, may impact the timing 
um, and energetic costs associated with migrations. So to build on this work, I would like to expand spatial coverage within the Bahamas and regionally. And there is work that's currently on, underway to develop uh, and annotate the genome for NASA grouper. So to do, to do this and then use that uh, to better explore these processes of selection and population structure. Um, and moving forward also to couple this with understanding larval modeling and connectivity through biophysical modeling um, and ocean currents so that we have not only a better understanding of where all the active FSAs are, uh, we'll also have a better understanding of where fish are migrating to to participate in these FSAs, but where fish are being recruited to after they spawn so that we you know, are able to uh, provide better long-term protection for this uh, iconic species. So our research clearly has highlighted the need for more effective management and policies to help rebuild grouper stocks and ensure sustainable fisheries, especially for species like Nassau grouper that are important for reef health. So as a country, uh, we need to increase our capacity for consistent monitoring and enforcement to address some of the inaccuracies that stakeholders have with regards to the current status of Nassau grouper. Um, and that can be achieved through developing uh, accurate and diverse materials targeted for specific stakeholders. And there is also a need for us to work at a national level and a regional level uh, to address issues related to FSA fishing and illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, which undermine uh, population recovery efforts. And this is something that we need to be working on in a very time efficient manner. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank all of the individuals um, and organizations that have contributed to this work uh, over the last several years. This work was ongoing between 2014 and 2017, and particularly to the Save Our Seas Foundation and the Lifer Key Foundation uh, for funding the genomic uh, work. So if you'd like to learn any more about our uh, NASA group of research and spawning aggregation work, you can visit our website at perryinstitute.org uh, and also follow us on social media at Perry Institute for Marine Science. So thank you very much. And I will turn it back over to Judy and Francisca. Thank you, Krista, ever so much for uh, starting us off on such a uh, firm understanding of what's happening to the Bahamian Nassau grouper populations this afternoon. Um, our second plenary speaker will be Dr. Diba Amon, and she's a Trinidadian marine biologist who's won international awards for her research on the animals of the deep sea. And that include, they include the chemosynthetic hydrothermal vent environments of the Cayman Trench in the Caribbean, and the polymetallic nodules in the North Pacific's clarion clipperton fracture zone, among other locations. She's currently a research fellow at the Natural History Museum in London and founder of Species, advocating for the sustainable use of the seas surrounding Trinidad and Tobago and in the Caribbean. And she will address the hidden habitats of the Caribbean depths. So, if you're ready to share your screen. Great, thank you, Judy. Um, can you hear me okay, first of all? Yes. Great, okay. Let me just try to see if I can get things going. Share. Okay, and I hope you can see my screen now. Yes. You can okay, put it you know, it's the baby steps, baby steps. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes. Fantastic, okay. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My sincere thanks to you all for joining us today and also to the organizing committee, Judith and Francisca, for inviting me to present as part of Global Coral Reef Week. Um, as you've heard, my name is Diva Raymon and I'm a deep sea biologist from Trinidad and Tobago. I'm currently trapped in London, quite literally, um, where I'm a scientific associate at the Natural History Museum. But of course, I'd prefer to be home, as um, Judy mentioned, where I'm a co-founder and co-director of the nonprofit species that focuses on marine science, education, and advocacy in Trinidad and Tobago. 
So I tend to work on the big charismatic animals in the deep ocean and how we humans are impacting them. And that means that I find myself increasingly at that nexus of science, communication and policy, which let me tell you is a fascinating place to be as I'm sure many of you on the on listening know. So full disclosure, I feel very much like an imposter here. I am absolutely not a coral biologist in any way, shape or form. And um, so instead I'm gonna be telling us or, or discussing um, not details around coral reef science, but instead as one of the few Caribbean marine biologists who have had the opportunity to um, study the region's deep seas to take us through some of those habitats with a focus on corals. So, and also um, contrary to um, the previous presentation, brilliant presentation, um, I'm not gonna be focusing on my work. It's more of a general overview. So when we think about Caribbean corals, beautiful images like this one from off Tobago is what springs to mind often. Um, and this is a quick plug, sorry, for the Maritime Ocean Collection, a project led by Dr. Anthony Denaist and Species that integrates state-of-the-art 360 degree photography, Google, Google Street View, smartphone technology and videography to allow anyone to engage with Trinan Tobago's remarkable underwater world. I do suggest if you have a chance, go and check it out, Maritime Ocean Collection. Um, but yes, these seascapes with sunlight cascading down to reefs that feature a variety of corals surrounded by many different sp fish species and other species is really what tends to mind when we think about the Caribbean. But what we do not tend to think about in respect to the Caribbean corals are images like these captured by the NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer, and I hope you're all able to see this okay. So these are from off Mona Island off Puerto Rico, and they were captured in 2018. And these are corals that are thousands of meters deep out of the reach of sunlight. And in fact, that is where two thirds or over two thirds, sorry, of coral species live in waters that are deep, dark and cold. And they come in all shapes, sizes and colors as you would have just seen, just like in shallow waters. So let's take a step back, um, some deep sea background to help um, set the scene for the rest of the talk. Um, but the deep sea is everything from about 200 meters depth all the way to the deepest point on the planet at just under 11,000 meters in the Mariana Trench. And if you look at this map, that's everything that's blue. So obviously a substantial part of our planet. In fact, the largest ecosystem by far. It occupies over 60% of the Earth's surface and provides over 96% of all the habitable space on Earth. And not only is it the largest ecosystem, but it is the most poorly explored by a long way. We have seen less than 1% of our seafloor, in fact, less than 0.001 and lots of zeros, ones, um, and don't even really have complete high resolution maps. And that means that entire mountains, entire seafloor features are missing, much less the information about what is inhabiting these places. And that's because it's expensive to study the deep sea. You need high, lots of infrastructure that costs a lot, um, ships capable of going far from land for long periods, and the technology uses incredibly high tech. It's not an easy place to work, given some of the conditions that we're going to talk about shortly. And this has led to the ability of exploring the deep ocean really being in the hands of just a few nations globally. Um, and of course, the Caribbean, sadly, is not on that list. Um, and that has led to not just a lack of exploration, but also a lack of knowledge and awareness, um, especially within the Caribbean region, as I just mentioned, and, and unfortunately, corresponding with that, a lack of management when it comes to these very big spaces. But we do, the good news is that we do know more than we ever have, and some of the, um, what's the right word, variables we find ourselves, you know, attributing to the deep sea include that there's no sunlight, um, definitely once past you, once you go past about 400 meters, there's no sunlight. Temperatures hover just above freezing. There are very high pressures and also there's very low food input. And something we're increasingly learning more and more, which I'm sure many of you listening are very familiar with, is that even though the deep sea may seem remote and separate, it is still very much connected to the rest of the ocean and the rest of the planet vertically with shallow marine habitats and even terrestrial habitats, but also horizontally with between oceans and so on. 
And we're also learning for a few deep sea species that we do have this information for that life tends to take on a much slower pace because most of the food in the deep ocean drifts down from the surface in, in the form of marine snow. Um, there isn't really much to go around. And that combined with cold temperatures mean that life is slow. We see animals conserving their energy and that means slow metabolism, slow movement, slow growth. And this also often leads to very great ages in animals. So in fact, some of the oldest animals in the world are found in the deep sea and are coral. So in the left, you'll see this is Lophelia pertusa, a reef building coral in the deep sea, and they're known to live for over a thousand years. In the top right, we have Kulamanamana, a Hawaiian gold coral, which is known to live for over 2,700 years. And, and then in the bottom right, we have Leopathy zanosa, which is a black coral that is known to be one of the oldest animals on the planet and live for over 4,000 years. And I want you to just stop for a second and ponder that. I mean, this is one animal that has been alive for a length of time that has spanned from nearly the building of the Great Pyramids to now. And it, you know, it really does just blow your mind. And in addition to the great ages, we also see that there's late maturity often, um, late sexual maturity and, and low or variable reproduction rates, which means that life in the deep sea doesn't really deal well with changes or impacts. It's very slow to recover. So with that out of the way, let's turn our attention back to the Caribbean. So most of the Caribbean is actually deep sea. For instance, Trinidad and Tobago is 65% um, by area, deep ocean, and that's low because of our position on the South American shelf. Actually, for many Caribbean nations, it's probably over 95% of their area. Um, and that's, you know, a lot, much less if you think about it from a volume perspective. And yet so little is known. We, for most of it, we can't answer that very basic question of what lives there, much less questions about the ecology of the animals that live there, like what do they eat? How do they reproduce? How old are they? What role do they play in the ecosystem? So these are the areas of the Caribbean where work has been done in the deep ocean. The stars are obviously not to scale. Um, instead, it's more that they are, have been mere specks in the vast Caribbean deep ocean where work has been done. So today I'd like us all to go on a quick deep sea adventure visiting three of these um, locations and focusing on the deep water corals there. Um, which are, of course, amongst the most poorly understood groups of animals in the global deep ocean, not just in the Caribbean region. So we'll begin uh, it, off the US Virgin Islands and British Virgin Islands in the region of the Anagata Passage. And I hope this video is working. But really, the exploration and research there has been primarily undertaken by the Ocean Exploration Trust and NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research. And it's revealed that the seamounts in this area, so mountains at the bottom of the sea, are home to incredible habitats and animals, including many, many species of corals. Some of the most common species of um, corals include Enolopsamia, Madrepora, Dendrophilia, Selenos, well, I knew I was gonna mess that one up. <laughs> Selenosamilia, Javania, and Madrasis. And we're also, we've also seen a lot of large corals, especially black corals like Leopathies and others. And these deep sea corals are really important for reasons that are not dissimilar to those in shallow reefs, things like they provide three dimensional structures that create habitat, shelter, substrate, food. And most deep sea corals also, as you'll see from the video, have those commensal invertebrates of some kind, whether they are squat lobsters, as you would have just seen, brittle stars, as you can see now, anemones, worms, zoanthids, crinoids, those tend to find homes in these um, deep sea corals. So moving south on this whistle stop tour, we're going to head to Barbados and the Barbados secretionary prism. So that is this entire lobe you can see down around Barbados in the bathymetry. Um, and it extends not just within Barbados waters, as the name implies, but also to the waters of other Caribbean islands like Trinidad and Tobago, like Venezuela, and northwards as well. Um, and it really murks from sorry, is, is really extends from 600 meters all the way down to over 5,000 meters depth. So a substantial depth. Um, and so how this is formed is the South American plate is subducting below the Caribbean plate and that off scraping during that process results in lots of organic material being scraped and compressed and altered 
and that results in lots of hydrocarbon and other chemicals um, within the seafloor, but also seeping from the seafloor, as well as, as you can see from this map, really interesting bathymetry. And work has been done in this region since the 1980s, but primarily by French and American teams and never by scientists, but from the Caribbean, unfortunately. And although I wasn't on this um, research cruise in 2012, I am working up this material that, oh, this video is not playing, that's okay. Um, let's see if we can move it along. Okay, well, it's supposed to be a beautiful video playing in the bottom, but don't worry, you can just imagine it. Um, so what we're seeing is that um, while the work has focused on other habitats off of um, Barbados, it's also revealed the presence of some corals, including some very large corals and likely old corals, um, especially along very steep slopes with strong currents and hard substrates. And of course, those are favorable positions for these corals given um, they need a surface to attach to. And also there is no sunlight, so the corals instead filter feed um, from food passing in the currents, which you can see if the video is playing, is plentiful in some of these locations. And our final stop on our whistle stop tour um, is last but certainly not least, in my opinion, the deep waters of Trinan Tobago, the most southerly of all the Caribbean nations. And so in my own waters, there have been two main efforts, again, to study the deep ocean, those by French scientists. And then again in 2014, a cruise from the Nautilus, the Ocean Exploration Trust ran that, which was different to the work that has primarily taken place in the Caribbean because Caribbean scientists, Trinidadian scientists were able to participate in a meaningful way. And I cannot truly put into words how special it was to see the deep ocean of my own country's waters for the first time after having studied it elsewhere um, in the world for many years. So we explored four sites beginning at about 800 meters depth, extending down to 2000 meters on, again, on the Barbados secretionary prism, but within Trinidad's waters. And as you can see from the images, there were lots of corals again observed. Things like Amphianthus, Plumarella, Thularella, um, many of them, again, with those commensal invertebrates, as you can see from the images, a lot of squat lobsters in those, as well as some um, anemones and ophiroids. And to move us away slightly from corals, kind of, but kind of not, um, interestingly, the corals in Trinidadian, Trinbagonian waters, sorry, appeared to be connected to and influenced by methane seeps nearby, which you can see in the video here. And these sites were even more spectacular than we could have really imagined. Um, methane seeps are areas in the deep sea where methane rich fluids seeps from the seafloor, you know, ergo the name, um, and powers really unique ecosystems via chemosynthesis. And that's of course the use of chemical energy to create food rather than sunlight in the case of photosynthesis. And because of that um, abundance of a prim primary energy source compared to a lot of the rest of the deep sea, there really is an abundance of life in these areas. And we observed zones extending out outward from fluid sources with corals in the furthest zone of influence. And we suspect that because of the increased productivity and hard substrate from the methane seeps, um, these corals were benefiting and therefore more abundant than in background areas. So some deep water coral ecosystems, um, as well as the methane seeps you can see in this video, ooh, interesting, as well as the methane seeps you can see in this video, which I'm going to get to play again while I'm talking, um, exhibit many of the characteristics of the FAO's vulnerable marine ecosystems or VMEs and the CBD's EBSAs, ecologically and biologically significant areas. So while we begin to explore and understand these areas, we as scientists um, should be thinking about these places through a management lens. We should remember that the deep sea globally is not at all out of our reach, um, directly through increasing extraction of resources there, um, but also indirectly through climate change and pollution, for instance. And an example of this is that these sites that you can see in this video, um, as well as the previous images of Trinidad and Tobago, have already, are in areas that have already been leased for deep water oil and gas extraction that is scheduled to occur um, in the near future. So something to consider that these um, very vulnerable and potentially unique ecosystems are already at risk. So to wrap up, um, 
with that in mind, I'd like to leave you all with a quote um, from Pliny the Elder. He was a Roman historian, naturalist and author. And in about 77 AD, he said, by Hercules, in the sea and in the ocean, vast as it is, there exists nothing that is unknown to us. And of course, at that point, nearly 2000 years ago, deep sea exploration had not even truly begun. And this is the exact kind of mindset that we as a community need to not have. The deep ocean, especially of the Caribbean, has so many more secrets to give up still. There is so much more to discover, including an incredible diversity of deep sea corals. And really, we need to keep investigating that. And while doing so, we need to make sure that we are creating equal partnerships with scientists in country if we are not from country. And we need to be thinking about how our research can contribute to the effective management of these places. Um, we also need to be sharing our discoveries. You know, we're very privileged to be able to see these types of ecosystems. And we need to share that with as many people as possible, including the public and decision makers. Um, I hope I've sort of left you with this feeling that the deep ocean is awesome and important, but ultimately that we can't manage what we don't know what we don't understand or what we don't value. Um, so thank you very much for listening and I'm very much looking forward to all your questions. Thank you ever so much, Deva. My pleasure. I, I really like your final statement about we can't share what we don't know. Um, and I'm gonna open up to the uh, questions and we have three in the Q&A, and I also have a few uh, that have come in privately. Um, and I'll start with the one for Krista because she spoke first. Are you still here? Yes, she's still here. In fact, we can see her now and she's still smiling. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Valerie Gregoire says, thank you for sharing your study to help the Department of Marine Resource Management in the Bahamas. It's so positive to have the possibility of changes in regulation. Is the department taking your recommendations positively? Or how hard is it to, to in, in, invoke changes in regulations? And then, yeah. also, and then also I would add, um, um, initiate adequate enforcement. Yeah, um, thank you for that question. Um, so far the department has been receptive. We've been keeping them up to date on our findings um, every year as we progress um, and have had meetings with uh, the Department of Marine Resources with the minister uh, to talk about these issues um, and they are taking it seriously. They've actually used it as an opportunity to, to scale up those initial stakeholder assessments that we were able uh, to complete uh, to a national level to understand more or less what other stakeholders are willing to support um, and there is uh, some support for that so that's encouraging. Um, I'm hopeful that within the next year or two, we can actually uh, see some changes to the regulations themselves. Uh, with regards to enforcement, uh, that is challenging. The Bahamas, for those of you that aren't familiar, it's huge. We're an archipelago, it's 700 islands spread out. Um, so just sort of north and east of, of Florida and then, um, well, not north and east, but those of you that know me know I'm a little bit challenged with geography sometimes. <laughs> especially underwater, um, but uh, across from Florida and a little bit south and north of Cuba. Um, so we're spread out in all those areas and there are a number of uh, spawning sites that have been reported. So as you can imagine, that's a lot of area to cover. So really what we've been trying to do with this, this research is identify the areas where there are still really active, healthy spawning aggregation sites and communicating that information to uh, law enforcement agencies. So to the Department of Marine Resources, to the Royal Bahamas Defense Force, as well as uh, to marine resource managers that manage marine protected areas if there's spawning sites that uh, occur there. So that's helping, um, but there are some funding gaps still to address uh, enforcement. Um, and there's some work that's being done on the regional level, for example, having a regional closed season for NASA grouper that may also help to address some of those issues, but that's all work still in progress. Thank you, Krista. I'll follow up with with questions for you while you're while you're here. Okay. And I don't hear any thunder in the in the background, which no, was a we're, we're good. Vote. It's it's cleared up now, so I think we dodged that bullet. Um, so I had a question that came in privately: was are the 
fishes at maximum size in the Bahamas decreasing as fishing pressure has increased, uh, such as is, is known in other overfish populations elsewhere? Mm -hmm. um, that's a good question. Um, and I cannot definitively say yay or nay at this point. What I can say, when we have been doing this work, we've been also collecting uh, length and weight data uh, from these fish. We know the size at which they first migrate to spawn. Um, so that's one of the reasons for uh, increasing um, the minimum size limit, because that it doesn't uh, uh, account for when they're first migrating to, small, uh, to spawn, it's too small. But it is likely that uh, we are you know, that, that the sizes of fish have also declined because that's a typical pattern that you see in, in populations that are heavily fished. And um, so I already know how big the Bahamas is and you have, you have convinced us it's, it's immense and you have an enormous job in front of you. But nonetheless, you have been asked if there's any research on how the Nassau's in the Bahamas are related to Nassau group or anywhere else in the Caribbean. Or, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so it appears, so there has been some work on a regional level um, using microsats uh, and a little bit of SNPs. And um, from that work, they uh, suggested that our populations may be genetically distinct from grouper uh, in, in other parts of the Caribbean. Yes, good. I, I, I didn't presume you would have had an opportunity to do that yourself, but I'm glad it's being done elsewhere. Um, yes. I have a question, which is, um, you mentioned the need for anthropogenic improvements. And apart from reducing the fishing pressure, uh, is there anything specific that you were thinking of that would help Nassau groupers in particular recover their population sizes? Yes. Um, so in addition to the fishing pressure, uh, NASA grouper also, throughout their life cycle, they use different habitats. So the nearshore nursery habitats are really important early on when uh, mortality, mortality tends to be a little bit higher. Uh, so reducing uh, habitat loss and degradation to those nearshore nursery areas, particularly mangroves uh, that are associated with coastal development, uh, would be uh, valuable as well. And we all know that reefs are experiencing a number of threats right now, um, and new threats um, in the Bahamas as well with stony coral tissue loss disease. So ensuring that we can uh, maintain or improve the quality of those habitats are going to be extremely important for ensuring that this species has a home um, in the future. Okay, well, I'll leave you to recover for a few minutes okay. and I'll ask some questions of Diva. And there are a few here in the Q&A, so I'll start with them. Um, the first question is from 692819, whoever that is. <laughs> Who's wondering, do the uh, ecosystems at that suffer in the same way that shallow water ecosystems are, um, are so greatly affected by the warming and the acidification as a result of the excess uh, of carbon dioxide emissions at the moment as the CO2 enters the surface waters? Or are they lagging behind or do they show no effects as yet because they're so far away? I mean, that's a really great question. Um, and something that I know a lot of deep sea scientists are working towards understanding right now. I mean, really, we can't answer that question in with great certainty, given the level of knowledge we currently have. But um, there's been a couple of modeling studies in, in as well, including one which was published uh, on Monday that I was a co-author on that shows through modeling approaches that climate change is already having an impact and of course climate change being deoxygenation warming and acidification is already having an impact in many areas of the deep sea and that they will not be impacted equally over time um, but that within our lifetimes we'll start to see very huge changes in um, temperature and oxygen uh, acidification as well as um, that trickling of food, which I mentioned from the sea surface in the form of marine snow, that changing as well, that could have profound impacts on um, the deep ocean and the communities there. So something that really we're still working to understand, but we, as far as we know, you know, these things really do vary according to where you are and according to um, what exact, which of the exact sort of impacts of climate change you're looking at. All right. 
Thank you very much. And uh, Valerie Gregoire has a curiosity question. How much trash do you see on the deep sea floor? Yeah, so this is something that is repeatedly as deep sea scientists brings us back to reality because you're there and you're um, exploring and you're seeing new habitats, new species, new behaviors for the first time. And then boom, in the middle of this place that's never been explored by humans before, there is some of our trash and they're usually just household items like beer cans or plastic bags or i mean we've seen it all like books insulation from housing chairs it's all down there and i think you know this is something that we've come across or at least i've come across on nearly every single research cruise that i've been on no matter where in the world we are from the mariana trench to the antarctic to the caribbean and um really it's a reminder that no place on this planet including the very remote deep ocean is out of our reach. All right. Um, let me see. Have from Ilaria Stolberg, have fishing practices like dredging damaged the mm -hmm. coral ecosystems in the areas in which of your interest? So I'll start with addressing that in the Caribbean. Um, and unfortunately, because so little of it has actually been explored, it's um, that's not something that I've ever come across in my work there, um, thankfully. Um, but that's not to say that hasn't been the case because so little has been explored. Um, but of course, elsewhere in the world, it is um, pretty conclusive that fishing so far has wreaked the most havoc in the deep sea as far as industries go. Um, there are areas, especially on seamounts, those mountains at the bottom of the sea that are fishing hotspots because of the productivity in the water column, where, you know, communities have just been clear cut by bottom trawling. And we've also seen many fish communities targeted. And because of the slow reproduction rates, um, those are just boom bust uh, fisheries that just result in populations completely collapsing and taking very, very long to recover. And it's of course, devastating to see the impacts of bottom trawling um, in shallow waters. You know, it's just such a devastating practice. But it's even more so, at least for me, to see it in the deep ocean where we know that corals down there take hundreds and often thousands of years to grow. So that really recovery there is um, going to be very slow, um, if at all. And, um, and also that, you know, we're not really quite sure what the impacts of taking away these communities, this biodiversity is to, or will be to impacts on the services that the deep ocean provides. Okay, thank you. Um, I had another one here for you. Well, in fact, there's a lot here for you. I'm just trying to choose some <laughs> And um, so one person wants to know while I'm, while I'm casting around, um, Sherrod Bayana wants to know um, how much of your work is done with in, inside of submersibles, how much with uh, ROVs or um, how much of it is with other kinds of remote instrumentation? Where do you get your information? Uh, again, great question. Um, because I work on the charismatic animals, you can see with, you know, that tend to be one or two centimeters or larger in size, it means I work a lot with imagery and that can come from um, ROVs, remotely operated vehicles, those vehicles we send down that we do not ourselves go in, um, or submersibles, the ones you do actually go in, um, or often baited traps and, um, not baited traps, baited cameras. Um, and other forms of instrumentation like that. But as I mentioned or touched on briefly in my um, talk is that those types of technologies are limited really to very few countries. And while I've been very lucky to have access to them through my work, not everyone does. Most people do not. And that is a massive problem, including in the Caribbean. And so if we want to get more people involved um, in more, more areas of the planet, working towards that common goal of stewardship of our oceans, we need to have that technology made available to more people. And so looking for low cost uh, alternatives, as um, Sharad suggests, is one of the ways that we can potentially achieve that. So I know there have been, there are a couple initiatives right now looking at low cost drop cameras, um, as she suggested, that are able to go down into the deep sea, collect footage and come back up and can be launched from any vessel. Um, you don't need the massive ships and th that's great progress but again there are of course limitations to that type 
um, of technology, it's a point, um, your view is limited. Uh, and yeah, there's pros and cons to every piece of equipment. Um, but really, you know, we need much more innovation in that sector so that many more of us can be engaging in deep ocean science. Well, that's a good bridge to the question that uh, Tatiana Be Becker asked, which uh, noted that most of the work on the deep sea is done by um, people who live or come from organizations outside of the yep. outside of the marine tropics, and um, they're mostly organized by institutions in the U.S. or European countries, and yep. mostly involve researchers or students from outside the region. When I was a, when I was an undergraduate in Jamaica. The uh, Duke University used to send down a boat in the winter time to get it mm -hmm. in warmer climates. And because <laughs> the boat needs warm climates. <laughs> well, I think the uh, I think the crew liked it, and <laughs> they would come to Kingston and take on a, a a flock of of undergraduates and graduate students. So they deliberately made their research vessel available. To the and and also the uh, the local faculty to the local scientific community and students in training to get some practice being out in the uh, out in the deep ocean, and um, that would be one way to encourage more of that um, than currently occurs. But um, your mentioning of cheap per alternatives for collecting mm -hmm. data. Uh, at least at the preliminary level, is another perhaps um, valuable way of, of including more uh, local students and researchers in yeah, I think, oh, in their own area. So yes, what else would you like to say? Uh, I mean, I think as we're we're seeing more and more of a push globally for um, for us to make the most of the blue economy, and um, often where that is that is linked to resources in the deep ocean. And so for us to be able to not only for all nations around the world to be able to partake in the blue economy effectively and then and also manage their resources effectively, really, they do need to have access to their own um, waters. And so while, you know, Duke's actions are really admirable, um, that is still leaving the power with a few nations and isn't really sustainable. Um, and I think through, we're now at this, at this real golden age in um, awareness and uh, access to the deep ocean. And, and it's only going to get better as time goes on. Um, and that's through things like uh, um, capacity development initiatives, but also, which, you know, can be hit or miss, but, um, but also through the, the provision of low cost uh, and innovation of low cost technology and other items. But I mean, really, there are like very, um, there are some things that are very small steps that can be taken. And a, a quick story to sort of relay how much of a problem this is, is that um, Trinidad and Tobago, like where I'm from, innately uh, involved with the, with knowledge of the ocean there. And it wasn't, it's something that I've always been very interested in, so sought out, but it wasn't until I was in my final year of my undergrad um, at university in England, that was where I learned that, you know, Trinidad has like these, well, actually it didn't even hit home at that point. It was Trinidad, it was Barbados. The Barbados and Accretion Prism has these incredible um, ecosystem, methane seeps there, deep ocean ecosystems. And, uh, and looking into it, you know, you realize that actually there have been French scientists that came here in the eighties and then um, several other expeditions since then that may have just touched on the waters and so on. But really, you know, they came, they took samples, they got gathered knowledge and they left. There was no capacity development. There was no, there were no resources left in country. There were no samples left in country. And that is, or oftentimes there is not. And that's a problem. Uh, many of you may have seen Asher DeVos's opinion um, in Scientific American last week on colonial science or um, parachute science as it's sometimes known. And this is a massive problem in deep sea science because you know, we're far, oftentimes we're far removed from the shore and it, and you feel a bit disengaged or don't, don't feel you need to engage with the people within those nations. And time and time again, this is something that has been prevalent in deep sea science and open ocean science and really needs to change. Researchers coming from other countries to work in the waters of um, other nations need to be not just reaching out to say, come on board. No, 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 we don't need those token acts. We need equal partnerships from the beginning if you want to work in our waters. 
we need you need to be training folks you need to be providing technology and really there needs to be a much more um uh, equitable um and inclusive approach to working in other countries waters and that's just one of the tiny steps that can be taken to sort of alleviate this problem of that brain drain essentially well i'm so glad to see that krista has come back and is sitting down now because she does exemplify. <laughs> Would you like to say something, Chris? <laughs> oh, yes, sorry. Yes, I had to step away for one minute, but I am here. <laughs> <laughs> she does exemplify that um, there are scientists who go away to get a graduate degree and come back. Yep. And increasingly in the, in the Caribbean area, uh, coral reef research and other shallow water marine research is being, uh, is being required to file permits with the local governments to be able to conduct work by, um, especially from outsiders, and is increasingly uh, engaging local um, community members along with the local students and, and research community. Um, but there's, but you're absolutely right, there's a lot more that needs to be done, particularly in engaging all sectors of the local society, because that's, yeah. that's where usually the the great um, um, lacking uh, occurs that only only the well educated have an opportunity to uh, engage in this wonderful uh, um, pursuit of, of science. Um, in our last minute, we have an anonymous attendee who said great presentations to both of you and thank you. And a question for you both was, how do you connect with the policymakers so that they will pay attention? And Krista, can I start with you? since sure. you probably have more experience. Yes, um, yeah. and that's an ongoing challenge. We're constantly looking at ways to try and refine that approach, um, but definitely explaining things to them in a way that makes sense and is relevant to them. Uh, they're often concerned more with the economic side of things um, as opposed to the pure ecological side of things. So providing that context has been uh, useful as well. Um, especially if you can talk about job security, livelihoods, food security, uh, and then the benefits if we're talking about reefs um, in terms of protecting the country like the Bahamas. Um, so I think that's been uh, helpful in helping to, to get them on board. Um, but it's still a work in progress. And I think one of the things that uh, will be helpful moving forward for us is to really work with people that have more of a background and experience with uh, social science and with behavior change, because that's something that we, we really need to address in order to change the dial. Um, because for, for NASA Grouper, the biggest issues um, that we're experiencing are fishing pressure, um, and that's a demand, and it's partly a cultural issue as well. So really getting people to understand um, why certain practices aren't sustainable, what the benefits would be to them um, beyond just the ecological benefits. So just providing that context and, and explaining things in that way um, is, is something that we're working more towards. How long has it taken to get this far? How many a years? Really, a really long time. So uh, it's, it's been a really long time. We have uh, had had a permanent closed uh, season since 2015. Uh, the first stabs at having variations of the closed season started back in 1999 with site-specific FSAs. So I can just tell you how long the process has been. Um, and it's been at least two years now working on trying to have uh, changes to fishery regulations um, that you know, we now know should be made based on the science that we currently have available to try and get those adopted. So it is a slow process. I wish it were a little bit faster, um, but hopefully things will improve over time. But, but it's really important for everybody to know that you have to be in this for the long haul. Yes, this is not yes. a sprint. <laughs> this is a, a marathon or two. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm so sorry we have more questions, but that's all the time we have today in the schedule. And so I'm going to uh, wrap up this session, this third session of the Global Coral Reef Week by thanking all our panelists, especially all of those of you who've submitted questions, even if we didn't have time to answer them, they will be recorded and you may hear from one or the other of the speakers later on. 
And definitely so much thank Krista and Diva. I think it's just wonderful that we started in the Bahamas and ended in, Trini in Trinidad. Um, and I also want to especially thank the Company of Biologists, which is headquartered in Cambridge, England, for its generous sponsorship of these virtual meetings we're having this week. And Tradewind Colors, which is a local artistic enterprise and fundraiser based in the Turks and Caicos, Caicos Islands, because they have provided the gifts for our plenary speakers and our trivia winner. Tomorrow, we have a big program between one o'clock and two o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. There is a discussion session on Cayo Arca, which is on the ecologically diverse Campeche Bank in the Southern Gulf of Mexico that is also extensively exploited by the petroleum industry as some of you Caribbean folks will know. And then between 2.15 and 2.45 will be the second networking session, which I can really recommend because the first one was, was a lot of fun and very engaging. And then between three o'clock and four o'clock, we will have the next plenary session on local community outreach and climate change, which is a perfect continuation of some of the discussions that were started today uh, with Robbie Sigpen describing the excitement of environmental education and when it occurs in local indigenous languages. And Neil O'Coley talking about climate change, a subject that is taken very seriously in the Caribbean. So thank you all and um, Hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you both. Bye. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Bye. And thanks to Francisco up there, who's been serving as our technology assistant, as well as organizer of the whole meeting concept. Thanks, Judy. And thanks for moderating today.